athletics were cut short in spring seasons, knowing that it was knowing that it was with a very heavy heart that Williams made the decision about fall competition for this year. Your coaches and I wish it could be different. But we also believe this is the right choice for the moment. We are actively working on plans to engage in practice and team activity as appropriate when you return to campus. We have sorely missed you. We also know that coming back to campus may not be the right decision for everyone. So we are hopeful we will be able to answer some questions today to make that decision a little bit easier. However, I will say up front that we do not have all of the answers right now, but we are working on getting them. We've assembled this panel to address questions you might have. Uh, Carolyn Miles, Associate Director of Physical Education and Student Athlete Wellbeing is with us today, as well as Tommy Verdell, Associate Director for Inclusion and Compliance. Rod Lanou, Director of Sports Medicine. Marlene Sandstrom, Dean of the College. Rob White, Director of Parent and Family Programs. And Chris Herman, who is the Assistant Athletic Director and Head Softball Coach, will serve as our moderator, helping us sort through um, questions today or as our facilitator. Uh, Chris, you just want to explain um, how the questions and Q&A will work? Sure, uh, welcome everyone. So we're going to use um, the Q&A function that you see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. That's a, a chat function question um, portal. So please use that and we'll be monitoring that and tossing those questions out to um, the various panelists as we, as we go. And then later on, we will have a live Q&A where you can raise your hand. That function will show up near, the, near to the end of the call where you can raise your hand and we will unmute you and you can ask uh, a verbal question of somebody on the panel or just a general um, question. So um, that's really um, the extent of the tech part. So we will um, be looking for your questions in the chat function and um, that's it, we look forward to it. So thanks, Chris. Uh, let me start by telling you a little bit about what we do know um, and answer some of the questions that we've, we've already been asked. Uh, fall athletes will return along with the rest of the student body in stages and will begin those athletic medical screens of athletes after the return to campus COVID testing is complete. The exact date that we'll be able to start fall sports practices is yet to be determined um, as we anticipate a longer timeline in getting athletes through the medical screening process. As teams begin to practice, it will initially be in small training groups in a socially distanced fashion. You may be aware that in order to reconfigure academic schedules, um, to allow for more class time availability that we had to um, suspend the traditional division of the day for this year. Uh, we will establish the training groups based on class schedules and other sports specific categories once we know everyone's academic schedule. Um, this change, this may change as we move through the phases without any cases, um, if we can do that. Uh, we have not made any decisions yet about whether or not winter or spring teams will be able to compete. We will know a lot more once we see how the fall is going. We know things are changing really rapidly now. It is difficult to predict what things will look like in either October or in January. Um, I will pause to note here that any chance of moving to expanded practice groups or to competition will depend upon eliminating the spread of the virus. Athletes' adherence to public safety guidelines will be critical in getting us back to competition. As leaders on this campus, it will be important for us to model good behavior, including social distancing, mask wearing, and refraining from large gatherings. The entire campus will depend upon our compliance. Um, at the same time, of all these conversations have been going on on the Williams campus. You can imagine the NESCAC um, ADs have been gathering to discuss um, options for us in the fall and next year. So NESCAC has approved some relaxation of our normal out of season guidelines in an effort to support team engagement and coach involvement. Um, while we are still exploring whether this is possible at Williams and what form it might take, you should know that pickup games and practices will not be possible those types of pickup practices. Instead, we hope to find a way to schedule these practices with coaches present to ensure safety protocols are being adhered to. Another change approved was to allow winter teams to begin practice October 15th rather than November 1st. And that's also to allow this more re phased return to practice like we have, we'll have in place for the fall teams. Um, there have been many questions coming to us about facilities and strength and conditioning. Um, opportunities. We will begin the fall doing as much as possible outside. Currently under state guidelines, we cannot use our indoor facilities. We are expecting updated guidelines on July 6th, but again, we've not seen those yet. After we receive those, we can continue our plans to allow some activity indoors, but that will likely be very limited and will need to be very scheduled. It will take some time to modify our indoor spaces to comply with proper distancing and disinfection requirements. So again, that is also a work in progress. Another area of concern I know is eligibility. If you do not compete, 
So let me be clear, if you don't compete in your season, you will not use a season of athletic eligibility. As Division Three athletes, you each have 10 semesters to get your four seasons in. However, at Williams, you can only attend eight semesters, so you would need to plan both your athletic and your academic timetable to play all four seasons at Williams. The opportunity to play in graduate school does exist, but it will necessitate finding the right place to do so. I'm gonna pause there for a second and ask Carolyn Miles to speak uh, some about what physical education will look like on campus next fall. Oh, thanks, Lisa, and, and thanks for everyone who's on this call today and for giving us some time to explain what's going on. So I'm, I'm here today in the capacity of the physical education coordinator uh, and just wanted to share with you guys, uh, with everyone rather, what we are doing to make sure that you have physical uh, opportunities on campus next year. So as you can imagine, your coaches and PE faculty are working hard to figure out what those classes will be and what they look like. As Lisa Melendy already mentioned, we will not be indoors in the fall. We are fortunate to live in a part of the country where the weather is usually quite nice during the early fall semester and plan to offer as many of the in-person classes as possible outdoors. In addition, we are working with faculty to develop hybrid and or online classes for those of you who are unable to join us on campus. At this point, there has been no change to the PE milestone. There is still an expectation that you will complete four PE credits in order to graduate. Uh, so making sure that we have enough opportunities for you to do so is important to us. In line with the academic schedule, we will not be offering any PE classes during winter study. Uh, so just please plan accordingly for that. Additionally, uh, at this point, for those of you who are first years, you know there is a swim requirement at Williams. At this point, we are um, postponing it. We are not changing the requirement, but we know we will not be able to do that in September. Uh, all of our classes, as I mentioned, will be outdoors and masks will be required when we cannot uh, guarantee social distancing. So we're working with the individuals and facilities to make sure that we have access to those spaces. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Carolyn. So I think we're ready to move to whatever questions you all have, and, and Chris will start us off there. Sure, so a, a big one that I know you've heard already from other people is the first question is, what's the protocol for participating if they're a remote student that's within driving distance of campus and could come for um, coach workouts? So I don't know if Lisa or Marlene wants to take that on. Yeah, Marlene, I don't know if what our, what our um, thoughts are around if a student is not enrolled on campus, but remotely their ability to participate in any activity on campus. Yeah, students um, who uh, are enrolled remotely will not be able to um, participate in practices um, or use campus facilities or resources. Um, the only exception to this is students who last spring went through the official process of petitioning to live off campus, the sea rising seniors. You are not considered enrolled remotely. You are considered uh, enrolled and in person. Um, uh, and that process that you know who you are that group that already went through that process, but anybody who enrolls remotely um, will have full access to the course catalog. Um, so, that, so that all the, the entire ac academic curriculum is open, but you will not have access um, to the campus. Great, thanks. Um, Rod, uh, there's a question about training room availability. Will students be able to go to the trainer for things like PT uh, and you know follow up for injuries? What will that look like? Yeah, so um, thanks for the question. There will definitely be uh, availability in the athletic training room, but it's going to be limited as compared to what student athletes are normally used to. We're going to have to curb uh, many of our daily um, treatments, uh, the typical things that student athletes would uh, use, such as the, the hot packs or the recovery machines or the, the game readies, um, those will probably be suspended, uh, particularly early on. Um, when it comes to injury evaluations, uh, rehabilitation, uh, those services will still and referral will still be in place. Um, I think when we talk about things like rehab, uh, many of those will be directed by athletic training services, um, but some of it will take place outside of the athletic training facilities. Uh, and some of it will be, although will be under the direction of us, uh, will be at home type programs. Uh, but those services will be available, they'll just be a bit limited in scope. Great, thanks. Um, 
Lisa, I know you can speak to the, the NESCAC uh, participation. So our decisions, uh, I mean, we've obviously seen a variety of different decisions from schools, but the question is, are the decisions with sports at Williams consistent with all the other schools in the NESCAC or is each decision, each school making decisions on their own? Right, each um, NESCAC institution is making their own decision and they have posted those. You will see that we are not the only um, campus that would not have fall competition. Uh, Bowdoin, for instance, and I think you will see some others that will announce uh, pretty rapidly uh, if you follow that thread. Uh, but again, the most liberal are folks that are saying, uh, we're gonna wait and see, we're gonna as things unfold, maybe we can get to that. Um, everyone will have a very slow and gradual uh, reintegration or re or resocialization of sports activity. Um, so again, I can't I can tell you I'm pretty confident nobody will be playing in the month of September, and it is a hope to get to competition, although um, it is not assured on any campus. Um, and, and just so everybody knows, I am going through these generally in order, although trying to to gap uh, batch them when they seem to be um, the same or similar questions. But now I have a question about outdoor club sports. Um, and you mentioned no, um, you know workouts, basically um, what people call captain's practices earlier. What can, right. what can they expect for club, outdoor club sports? Can they still right. um, practice like varsity sports? So club sports, we, it's a little bit of work in progress. They will not be allowed to compete off campus or have um, opponents come to campus, just like varsity sports. And we're working through what are the right protocols with the Office of um, Student Life where club sports sit. But we've discussed this uh, for this call. And we're trying to find ways to ensure safe practices and coverage for those practices as we anticipate needing to have some sort of supervisor at those practices as we would have at varsity teams. And if we can sort that out, um, there are also some medical screening questions we need to work through, which normally happens through our um, health center. So as we work through those issues, uh, we could have better answers. Again, it is our hope to find ways for everyone to participate in healthy outdoor activity this fall. Great. Uh, another question about sort of the uh, movement, you know, on and off campus. So will there be a restriction on practicing beyond campus boundaries? So like, uh, run, you know, runners and skiers and um, endurance sports like that, that practice off campus also crew. Um, what will that look like? Yep. So currently, as you know, we're restricting travel on and off campus um, for all sorts of things. Uh, so we to begin the semester, we will not be having teams travel to off campus venues uh, for any activity. And I know that can limit what you can do. Uh, we'll be trying to work out what you can do on campus. And I saw Marlene, you had unmuted. I didn't know if you had something to add to that. Okay. Uh, but we are not, part of that is the, the need to social distance means not having folks together in a van. Um, is you know that's now not possible as well as you know we're testing in our immediate area on campus and we would not be wanting to send students to any place where we don't have those same sort of testing protocol assurances um, there's a question here uh, are incoming freshmen who choose to take a gap year are they guaranteed their spots on teams when they come back what will what might that look like well coaches on this call well I guess that's just you Chris could correct me yeah. Um, there's sort of not a guarantee on spots. It's like, yes, we anticipate then happily that you will come join us if you take a gap year um, next fall and be parts of our teams. You know, we're really excited about that. There's no thought that there are spots that would disappear. You would be Williams students um, and you would come to campus and have that opportunity. Yeah, I would, I would have nothing more to add to that. I think if, if you were um, someone who the coach was excited about, you will remain someone that the coach is excited about. And I encourage you to have a really direct conversation. Um, I know most coaches are reaching out to their current and 2020 class roster. So um, hopefully you'll be able to have that conversation. I think that's really important. Thanks for that. Um, Lisa, do you anticipate under any circumstances winter athletes will be able to train together in December and January? So currently we're planning to start winter sports practices in October and in early November. Uh, so yes, um, in the same way the fall will do, a lot will depend frankly on how the fall goes uh, and what that looks like, what's happening on campus at the time. So our, again, our plan is to do the same sort of introduction phased approach to practice in the winter uh, when we begin there but much, like I said, will depend on what the fall looks like and, and what's happening on campus. So that question was about when we're remote, right? We're not here December and January in particular. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for clarifying there. Uh, there that remains to be seen. We're gonna make a decision in October. The president has, and I have discussed, 
you know, when is the right time to make a decision about whether athletes can be on campus in January or not. Currently, you know that um, you're not having winter study, but there will be students on campus in December and January that need to stay on campus for a variety of reasons. Um, so it's not impossible for athletes to be on campus, but we're gonna make that decision uh, later in October once we see how, how things are going and what our plans are for um, January. And there could be thoughts that one could stay if they never left campus, so that might be a high bar. So there'll be a lot to discuss, but that will be uh, in October. And as a follow-up, will winter athletes, if that is available, will they be able to go home and come back and do that? Or would that be they'd have to stay straight through? I think we're gonna have to figure that out, which we don't have an answer to yet, but it would mean when you came back to campus, that same sort of re-entry staging protocol that we will go through this fall, um, that phased approach to get back into athletics. Great, thanks. Um, Carolyn, um, somebody's asking how the van policy for PE classes will work, if that's on the table at all. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Similar to what Lisa said about the other practices that are off campus, we will not be having any PE classes that have to travel via van uh, to start. So I've already spoken with Scott Lewis. Uh, we know they use vans to get to various of the outing club PE classes. Bowling will not be something that we're doing right away, but as those um, restrictions change, uh, hopefully we will introduce something like that. Great. Um, uh, Sorry, I'm just trying to, to batch these together. Um, what about the, 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 um, the gym, right? So the workout facilities for students uh, to work out once, once winter comes along and can't train outdoors, what, what might that look like? Right, so we are in the midst of uh, two parts, this sort of two parts of the answer. Currently, Massachusetts is in phase two of its reopening plan, and so that we're not allowed to have those facilities open at the moment. Um, on July 6th, they will announce the next phase and the protocols for opening fitness centers, which we will quickly begin reading, although we have some hints about them, um, about whether people can be in the building or not. So the building may or may not be open when you arrive. But part of the problem or part of our planning will be ref refitting our building. What do we need to do to make it safe? We know that we will change the flow pattern, for instance, you know, we'll enter in one place, exit in another place. We will think about how we de-densify our areas. We'll have strict counts. We'll most likely have scheduling to come in to work out. You'd have to remain, um, you know, fill out a schedule so we know who's coming in and how many people are coming in. It won't just, I know that it will not just be open, come and work out as you want to work out. Uh, as you probably can imagine or remember, gyms are hot spots of uh, transmission of infection. So we were really need to be quite careful about how we reopen our building. And as I said, we'll be reconfiguring spaces, uh, limiting the numbers of people and the duration of time that people are in there. As we return in the, um, in the fall, we'll be trying to move things outside where we can to set up some, especially for, um, with, with our strength and conditioning team, our human performance team, um, Rob and uh, Marshall, where can we maybe set up some satellite outside places that we can do more safely, again, in small numbers to get that sort of um, conditioning in. Um, is there any possibility that fall sports will be able to have a spring season? And um, relatedly, will there be any NESCAC athletics this fall? Let, tell, we've answered that a little bit earlier, but tell some more about what you know. Right. So, you know, some um, NESCAC schools are more optimistic about their ability to, uh, to compete. Um, at this point, nobody has anything on the books to play. They are, there's some possibility that if things got better, um, some institutions might opt to try to schedule some events. Um, I, you know, I, we, when we made this decision, we made this decision and announcement because we found that really unlikely and, um, and especially for contact sports to be, and with the phasing time we would need to go through that we would not be able to get to a point where we could compete before the end of October, at which point it seemed um, maybe you know, inadvisable to now start moving people on and off campus at a point where we have contain things, we're in a good place, um, and there's you know, just two weekends left, for instance. Uh, then, sorry, Chris, can you ask me the other part of that question? Uh, I think it was just um, when NESCAC's complaining or is that the part you answered? Oh, having a fall, 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 fall sports season. Oh, in the spring, spring. right, thank you. Uh, so there's some conversation around that. That's something that we think would be incredibly difficult for us to do to run our fall seasons in conjunction with our spring seasons given our limitation on facilities and support staff in order to do that safely. Um, 
that doesn't seem like something that we think we can support. It, I know there's a lot of talk about that. Uh, I think there's a lot of question about whether that's something the Division three institutions can actually support um, logistically on their campuses. Uh, there is conversation the same way that we we're talking about allowing out of season workouts, which normally aren't allowed at NESCAC um, in the fall for spring teams. That's also something that we're exploring to be able to do in the spring with fall teams. Again, we are somewhat limited by um, facilities and in particular our ability to, to support um, for our support staff to keep everybody safe, uh, but we're, we're, we're actively discussing those options and, and looking for a way to do them if we can. Great, thanks. Uh, Marlene, this might be for you, uh, will be for you. Um, I'll just read it. Uh, can a student take some classes remotely and not compete in their sport and come back for an extra year on campus, compete and finish up their academic requirements? For example, can a rising senior stretch their last year into two and keep their eligibility? Uh, no, unfortunately, um, if you're enrolled, regardless of whether you're enrolled in person or remotely, that counts as a Williams semester or a Williams year. So you can't um, add on additional semesters or years beyond our, our eight semester rule. Great, thanks. Lisa, I think you, you answered this in your um, preamble, but it's being asked a couple of times again. So uh, essentially like, will practicing as a team in the fall cause a player to lose any eligibility? No, it will not. Um, eligibility, NCAA eligibility is triggered by your first contest. Uh, so if we don't have a first contest, then you can't use that, you can't trigger that season. We had some questions about intramural or just sort of pick up athletic activity, like can you go throw a frisbee around and those kind of things. And then, um, so if you can answer what that will look like, and then um, a question about enforcement, right? So like holding people to the to the letter of the rule, will students be reprimanded? even for social distancing and practicing outside without a coach that you mentioned earlier, like if they're not doing that in a responsible manner, what will, what will that look like in terms of holding them accountable? Right, so I'll, I'll answer the first part about it. You know, it's our um, feeling that there won't be a place for sort of pickup activities, which I know is really hard to hear. There's just that everything would be scheduled, including our facilities would be scheduled. We need to monitor them for disinfection. And then you said social distancing and what are they doing? Um, you know, what's the activity, how close are they getting, and again, having some sort of supervision. Um, you know, I've talked with Carol and some about this might be a time to have folks enroll in more physical education classes for that activity, whether you need the credit or not, so that you can, you know, you can use the facilities or be engaged or play a game and that sort of thing. Um, the enforcement are mechanisms or things that their dean's office is working on, um, and I don't know what Marlene has to say about that sort of enforcement and accountability. Sure. Um... First, I, I just want to echo what Lisa just said, which is that there are so many things that are going to be different about, um, about next year that are hard to wrap our heads around and I know are very disappointing for students, certainly on the athletics front, but on all kinds of other fronts as well. And I, I speak not just in my role as dean of the college, but also as the parent of a college student. I can imagine that you go quickly from being so thrilled that there's the opportunity to come back to then actually thinking about what is it going to like, what will it be like to be back and what, what won't I have that, that really adds to my joy in being here. And so I really recognize that you're asking these questions because you're trying to figure all of that out. I mean, that's why we're, why we're all here. I totally appreciate that. Um, in terms of accountability, we're really trying to think about this as a collective responsibility and a collective commitment um, to public health because the only way that we will be able to sustain having students on campus um, is if everyone, students, faculty, and staff all fully commit to um, the public health guidelines. Um, as soon as that starts to break down um, and the transmission takes off, we will no longer be able to have students on campus. So, for me, I'm not thinking about this as from a disciplinary perspective. I'll, there, there will be some consequences. I'll talk about it in a minute, but I think that's probably the wrong way to think about it. Like what will the disciplinary consequences be? Because by then it's too late, right? And already the, the virus has had a chance to um, run rampant on the campus. And the ultimate discipline will be that we have to close down the campus and everybody's gonna have to go through again what happened in March, which 
we really, really, really want to avoid. So the idea is that on the front end, when thinking about whether or not you want to enroll and be here in person, thinking about, can I make an experience here, given those guidelines, um, that will feel meaningful to me and that I can find joy in? Am I going to find ways to be physically active? Am I going to find ways to interact with other people and socialize in ways that are still fun but fall within the guidelines? And if you really feel like you can't, then it's a good time to think about the other options that are available, either enrolling um, rem and being a remote student or taking some, some time off. So having said that, um, we are still working on the process for how we will manage um, adherence to the guidelines. Again, we really want this to be a ground up endeavor. We want students to be taking responsibility both for themselves uh, their own behavior and also for helping to remind their peers about healthy behavior. So the public health commitment is not just about you follow, following the guidelines, but reminding your peers in civil ways and clear ways of the things that they can be doing. Like, hey, if you're about to leave your room, don't forget your mask. That should be a really common refrain. Students should be reminding each other of that. Hearing wind of large gatherings, saying something like, well, wait, is there another way we can do this? Um, so I'm really hoping that a lot of the conversations are, are going to have nothing to do with the dean's office. They're going to be conversations that, that students have among themselves, because I think everybody who comes back has the shared goal of wanting to be able to stay here. Um, in the case of egregious violations of those public health guidelines that really put the community at risk, um, there will be consequences. It could become a situation where we ask a student to shift from being an on-campus student to a remote student if we feel that they cannot behave in ways that, um, that, that, that are required in order to keep the community safe. Certain kinds of uh, egregious violations could result in going through the formal conduct process, um, the disciplinary process. Again, that's not the way we hope to look at this. I don't think that's the right way or the effective way um, to get us to a place where we're um, healthily and happily on campus. I think what we really wanna be doing is focusing on what we can do on the prevention end. Great, thank you. Marlene, while you're, while you're unmuted, oh, while you were unmuted, um, there's, there's a number of questions about um, training, uh, working out with the people in your housing pod, and um, will they be able to pick housing that way? How is that going to impact sort of both the restrictions or not lack of lack thereof later on? Yeah, this is um, still somewhat in the works. You're going to be hearing from Doug Schiazza, um, Senior Associate Dean of Campus Life, who um, will be managing the housing process. And pretty soon after July 10th, um, you'll um, be getting information about the housing lottery and how that process will work. Um, my understanding of it at this point is that um, students will create um, groups of up to six people that will be their pod, um, their residential group, um, and that within that group, um, there could be some relaxation of some of the um, public health requirements. So within that group in common spaces, um, not having to wear a mask, um, for example, because we're really thinking of those living groups that will be sharing a bathroom as kind of a family unit. I know some students were asking whether that, that meant that if you're in a pod like that, what, are there other things that you can do together um, that uh, would still be considered safe? I think in general, what we're saying is that when you're in your own common space, you can relax some of those guidelines, but if you're out in public, then obviously you still need to be wearing your mask and having your social distance from other people that are not in your pod. So there may be ways that students who are living together can interact in, um, in, in, um, in ways that give them a little bit more flexibility than other students, but mostly that flexibility is around inside your, your common area and li your living space. Um, coaches are gonna be making their own decisions about what's possible in terms of what the practices are gonna look like. Those decisions are probably gonna be team-based team rather than certain students who happen to be living together being allowed to do certain things that other people on the team who don't live together can't. I, I doubt that that's gonna be the case, although that's gonna be the, the coach's discretion. Great, thanks. Um, there's, Lisa, there's a bunch of questions about um, winter athletes, if they take the fall off or remote, will they be able to participate with their team in the spring semester if they come back? Um, not just winter sports, but I suppose dual season sports too. Um, so you can 
take that on, it would be great. Right, and let me just ask, if I got the switch right, you're saying if somebody was remote or wasn't here in the fall, would they be able to join back in with their team when they arrived in the, yes, certainly. I mean, and that happens now, if students who are abroad a semester or have a semester off for whatever reason, when they come back, they often rejoin their team and there's no, no reason why that would be any different. Right. I know there's um, also, just for everybody, there are a lot of um, answers to many of your questions are in the athletic FAQs. We'll still ask them, but be sure you can always go back, especially if you feel like you missed something. Um, Lisa, do you want to talk about, or maybe Rod also, the, the guidelines for shared equipment and uh, things like that and how that might change or adapt over the course of the semester? Like what are the current guidelines and what might that look like? Rod, do you want to jump in or do you want me to go? or? Sure, I can start. Um, so when you look at the NCAA's re-socialization of sport, um, there's, uh, you know, three phases uh, and getting to phase three doesn't mean we're in the clear and that we're not, you know, partaking in, in, in uh, all the social distancing and all the, the safe practices that we're talking about here today. But in those earliest phases, uh, particularly in one and two, uh, the use of, of shared uh, equipment um, is not recommended. Uh, initially, it, it was said that it was not to be shared uh, in some recent webinars that I've sat in with um, uh, where uh, Brian Hainline, the chief medical director for the NCAA has been present. Uh, he mentioned that they are rethinking some of that uh, in regards to uh, equipment like uh, a ball um, and that there may be some instances where we could use uh, equipment provided we had certain disinfection processes and that they were well thought out. Uh, but currently the recommendation for that early arrival in what we would say phase one uh, would be not to be using or sharing equipment. Um, if we're talking about other types of equipment, um, like uh, say, you know, a, a football tackling dummy um, or, uh, you know, uh, something like a, you know, repetitions on, on a weight machine, um, you know, we really, we probably wouldn't be running multiple people through that, right? Because we, we don't just have the time to disinfect after every repetition that someone would make in a, in a practice scenario. So I think it really depends on the piece of equipment that we're talking about. Uh, as with everything that you hear from everyone else here, um, you know, the, the major um, <clears throat> points um, have, have been discussed, uh, but some of the finer details are still being sorted through. Um, so right now, I would say that the equipment um, usage in a, in a kind of practice scenario um, is we're remaining to discuss that, um, and, and we haven't made any hard decisions. But I would say that coaches have come up with many ways to run practices without shared equipment, such as numbering balls. You bring you just bring your own. You you know, for a game like soccer, you would you don't use your hands, right? You just uh, bring your ball and you pick yours up at the end of practice or just the coach collects them all and throws them all out. So a variety of ways that our coaches are thinking about how to run these things um, in small numbers with equipment that doesn't need to be shared. We've talked about in physical education, potentially, you know, passing out badminton rackets, for instance, if it was badminton at the beginning of the class. And instead of returning them like you normally do with right now at the end of every class, you would just keep them for the quarter um, and always use your same racket and we would just collect them and disinfect them at the end. So there are lots of ways to, to get this done. Um, ahead, Lisa and Marlene, I just want to circle back for a second to the question about uh, somebody taking the fall semester remotely and then coming back in the spring. I, I just want to make sure that families of first year students understand that um, they're making a decision for the entire year, not semester to semester. And I don't know whether Marlene, you want to even further clarify that so I don't get it wrong. I just want to make sure that since we're talking to all families and students, including new ones, what that difference is. Thank you, Rob. That's a really important point. So um, uh, incoming first year students or transfer students who are interested in taking time off would take what's called a gap year. And that is, as it is named, a full year. Um, and you can do that. There's more information um, about that in the email that I sent to all um, students um, and also some information in the intent to enroll form. Um, students can automatically request um, a gap year and then they would be automatically um, reset to, to join Williams next fall. Uh, currently enrolled students, rising sophomores, juniors, and seniors who are interested in taking time off can take what's called a personal leave. And personal leaves can vary in length from one semester to six semesters. Um, and uh, again, uh, you can, uh, you don't have for a personal leave, you don't have to know right now exactly how long that leave um, will be. 
Um, but you just need to make sure that when you're ready to come back that you um, that you uh, complete the readmission form, um, which needs to be in by uh, July 1 for students who intend to return for a fall semester and by December 1st for students who intend to return um, for a spring um, semester. So that's just uh, some, base, um, some differences um, depending on, on, on your status as either a returning or, or a brand new student. Okay, thanks. Um, Lisa, okay. there's a number. Chris, yeah, can please. I say one more thing about For the sure, leave? I'm not sure. I, I'm not good at looking at the questions at the same time um, that I'm talking, so I'm not sure if this is a question here, but I know it's been a question elsewhere, which is um, that Williams is going to work really hard um, to honor students' requests about timing for return. We have some boilerplate language um, that you'll see if you uh, request a personal leave that says that we cannot guarantee um, that you can return at the when you want to. That um, would only apply in a really extraordinary circumstance um, that, has, that I don't anticipate at this point. Given what we know at this time, um, we intend to work hard to accommodate students' return when they want to. So if you are interested in thinking about taking the fall off but want to turn, come back in the spring, you can be fairly confident that you will be able to come back in the spring. Similarly, if you want to come back in the fall, I just I want to make sure that students know that our goal is to work really closely with students um, and have them take the time off that works for them and, and have the return time that works for them as well. Great, thanks. Lisa, there's a, a number of questions about, uh, which I know you don't know the clear answer, but about the probability of winter sports are also like, is there a threshold that something specific or, or not that triggers that will might trigger that decision for, for winter sports? Right, as uh, President Mandel likes to say, we are an evidence-based institution, so it'll really be based on what evidence we have at the time, right? We know that we don't know everything right now. Um, if we had to make a decision right now, uh, we wouldn't do it, right? But we are hopeful that the experiment of coming back to campus and that the world will be moving into the uh, to a better place uh, in terms of the virus and that we will be able to do it, that we'll learn a lot in the fall if it goes really well to um, Dean Sandstrom's point, if we can maintain our social distancing and follow our public health rules and, it's, and we can know that we're in a safe environment, we might be able to do this. Um, again, it's not in a vacuum, right? So I, we also have to have opponents. If you're talking about competition, uh, we'd have to have opponents that we felt confident were had the same sorts of protocols and the same low infection rate or zero infection rate in order to travel to them. And again, we will, as I said, learn a lot in the fall um, and be in a better place to make a decision. I would not wager any money in either direction on it at this moment in time. So the probability answer, I can't really, I can't respond to um, other than it is as everything in the moment, a wait and see uh, as we get more information or if something changes in the public health sphere uh, that we can go forward with confidence, but we're not there yet. Um, Carolyn, I, I believe you said this in your opening comments as well, but can you talk a little bit, uh, this specific question is given the new reduced minimum required classes um, for rising seniors, varsity athletes, or any student, will the PE requirement be reevaluated as a graduation requirement? And uh, yeah, that's- Yeah, so I saw that one. Um, no, not at this point. So students have, 20 opportunities to earn four physical education credits. Uh, with the loss of winter study this year, we have 19 opportunities to do so. For most folks who are on this call, whether you're a varsity or club sport athlete, you still will get credit through your sport. Um, you can get up to three that way. So I think, I think we should be okay. If anyone has particular concerns, please do not hesitate to reach out and we can help you with that. Great. Um, more specifically about COVID, what will the procedures be for fall and winter sport, I guess, for anybody, if someone on the team who exhibits symptoms, uh, will the phasing process begin all over again? I know we have quarantine and isolation rules, but what about for the team? You know, I'm looking at Rod, whether that he knows better than I, but we will, but maybe you don't. Uh, you know, again, if you are tested, if someone in your cohort is tested positive, you've had uh, close interaction with them, you know, uh, you will be also be tested and potentially isolated. Uh, and so again, we might have to start back over again at new phases. And again, that we was going to work through this. Um, you might have been seeing, following the news with the Division One football where they have started and stopped, started and stopped, um, and sort of need to begin again. And again, this is new to all of us. So we're watching closely what's happening um, in those 
in those programs. Uh, but we would, again, you, you know, it is, you would probably step backwards. Um, and again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Rod, if you have some sort of incident or outbreak, we need to start again in smaller groups and move forward again. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, you know, early on, we're going to be uh, you know, practicing or gathering in, in small groups anyway. If someone were to, to test positive and it was deemed through contact tracing that the, you know, other individuals, uh, you know, within their, within their practicing pod were considered close contacts and those individuals could be placed uh, into quarantine during that time. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to take an entire team out of uh, participation for, for the fall, but definitely anyone who is deemed uh, to be a close contact. Um, you know, that the definition of close contact is something like, you know, you're, you're breaking that six foot barrier for something, you know, longer than a 10 minute duration, but how that will play out in an athletic setting, I think remains to be seen and really will be up to those contact tracers. And part of our planning on having the team um, in these smaller pods is to limit uh, any kind of spread if there was some and also to be able to contact trace on the other end of it. So we're hoping that these training groups are consistent uh, so that you're with the same people so that as Rod said, if one pod couldn't continue, perhaps the others could keep, keep practicing. Um, this is a eligibility question again, and, and also I think we'll, Tim Marlene will be able to answer some of this. Um, if a winter student athlete were to take the spring semester off, would he or she be able to compete the winter season they started um, in the fall? I know there's a 60 day window, which I, I know you know where this is going, Marlene, about the 60 day window, but in a typical school year, most NCAA championships will have concluded within that window because winter study ends at the end of January and championships conclude by the end of March. Will the lack of winter study change this eligibility? So I don't know if Marlene wants to take that or Lisa um, as an eligible. Or, or Tommy, I don't know which one of us. Or one. Tommy, yes, sorry. Tommy, any of us. Compliance. I just wanna make sure I understand the question. I think I do. So if somebody um, who's a winter athlete decides to take um, this spring off um, and then um, comes back they complete three years uh, and then they have one semester left um, in order to meet their graduation requirements and they come back in the fall. Uh, a question that students are asking, I'm not sure if that's this question is, if I am wrapping up my final um, set of courses in the fall, um, could I continue through winter study as an enrolled student um, so that I could then um, continue with NCAA extension eligibility um, complete the whole season. And that we're trying to figure that out actually right now. Um, there's a group of folks who are working on some of the pieces of that, some of the complexities around this. And I think that we will have, uh, Lisa, you might have a better sense of, of, of timing of when we will know more clearly about whether or not that will be possible. The reason it's an issue at all is because um, our degree, we, we, two things. One, our degree requirements are now um, for anybody who's enrolled in this academic year is that you complete three winter studies. And so the fourth is not, not we're not clear on whether that's built in. Um, we might be able to finesse that. Um, and then there's the other question of how, where, um, how, who would, how many students would be interested in taking on um, a winter study and how we could manage that. Um, and so we're trying to work out the details. We understand that this is important for winter athletes. And so it's something that we're trying to figure out how to make um, work, but no firm conclusions yet. Lisa, do you have anything to add to that? So, uh, Tom, you just want to talk about the NCAA waiver for a second, then I'll come back to what's happening on campus. Yes. So what we did um, this last week, we submitted a waiver to the NCAA for all of our winter athletes to try to address that exact situation in which we're trying to get some clarification back from them as to how can there be an exception? What can we do? How can they, how can they fit that gap? So in case that situation does arise, um, how can we deal with it? Um, we, I don't think we've heard back yet, Lisa. I haven't, I haven't checked my email yet today. Tomorrow. They're meeting tomorrow. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, but so, and, and to be honest with you, like this being my first year, not to try to be the out here, I'm still trying to figure out the winter study thing. So I'm glad you, you spoke to that. But that's where we stand in terms of with the NCAA and the legislation that they have us following. Thanks, Tommy and Marlene. So yeah, we've been working on sort of two tier process, two tracks, uh, trying to figure out how this could work potentially at Williams and, and also through the NCAA um, legislative re relief waiver. Uh, and I will be speaking at a hearing tomorrow with them <laughs> to try to get that 
uh, have them. They are saying that these grant these waivers, just to be upfront, are, they're about 50-50 on them. So I again, I wouldn't put any money on this. I don't know which way the NCAA will going to go. It's going to go with this, and then we're working through the processes. As um, Dean Sandstrom said at uh, Williams uh, to, to think this through. And I think we, we understand the folks that are working on it that we would like to have a answer to that question prior to July 10th. So uh, stay tuned and hopefully we can get some information to you if, if that's a part of your decision-making process um, that we can let you know in plenty of time or in time. Great. Um, there's a lot, probably a dozen questions pertaining and things we've already touched on on just general recreation, right? Will people be able to go for a run together? Can they, um, you know, again, just go out and play? And um, I don't know if somebody wants to, to talk about that. It's not really, obviously, it's something that's legislated by the NCAA, but what will that look like? Right. So, you know, I think, you know, whatever you're doing, wherever you are now, like, yes, people can go out and walk. People can go out and run. If you can't, you know, if you can maintain social distancing, you can do it or you can do it on your own. Um, and so, yes, one can go do that. We, the, when I was talking about um, facilities and so on, first of all, on facilities that um, athletics schedules, right? So those are places that we're gonna, we grant permission to people to use, right? So we go through our scheduling system and one would need to schedule a facility and have some supervision. One would not be able to just have free play. Uh, and then there's this idea of like, right, you're out on Peresky lawn. Can I throw a Frisbee? Can I play tag? Not that I've ever seen anyone play tag. I'm just thinking, what, what are the things you can do out there? Uh, and that's what Dean Sandstrom, I think, was referring to. It's like maintaining good public health measures, right? Are you social distancing? Are you in masks? Um, are you sharing equipment, right? What are the things that you're doing um, to be safe? And that's, you know, very public behavior and that you're, you know, at the same time, we know that physical activity and healthy, uh, staying healthy lifestyle are important to your mental health, to your emotional well-being, and again to your physical health. So we want to find ways to keep people active and healthy and moving. Um, and as I said, you know, we're looking at how could we maybe offer additional physical education classes so that we can provide some of that opportunity. How can we make it so that club sports can continue to operate in some fashion so they can get out and, and be involved in things. Um, so we're really working hard to, to have those opportunities. And I was going to say before when I asked Carolyn about reducing the number of physical education credits, I think some of our feeling as physical educators is this is particularly not the time to do that when we know that being active is one of the most uh, healthy measures when people are feeling stressed, right? It's one of the, the best things you can do. So we will be working on that. And again, though, this sort of free recreation um, is difficult because you need to make sure that it's done in a way that keep that is promoting your health and not making you unsafe for the community. Okay, we have a question about um, dining and food. Um, it starts with athletes eat a lot. Um, do you know what the expected scenario is for kids and how they're gonna eat, get proper nutrition, et cetera? I do not know the, all of those answers. I don't know if Marlene knows those or anybody else can answer what the dining situation other than what I've just read. Yeah, on. Um, I. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a representative from dining, dining here on the call, but I can reassure you um, that for everybody who is here on campus, we will absolutely make sure um, that you um, get enough um, good nutritious food. The food, the dining is going to look really different. It's going to be takeout um, and there's um, going to be, um, you know, it, there's not going to be places to sit in the dining halls. Um, uh, I believe that Mission is not going to be open as a dining hall. It's going to be a staging area for a, a variety of other venues uh, where students will be able to go and um, pick up food. But we will absolutely make sure um, that, that all students, uh, in, including athletes, get enough um, to eat. And we have a fantastic director of, of dining to Mezgin. And if you have any particular concerns as an athlete about the timing, when you can pick up your meals or anything like that, um, you will always find an open ear um, with him. He's happy to work with you. Um, great. Maybe Marlene, this might be also for you. And just, we have 60 something questions in the, ch in the chat queue. And I know we are going to open for some live questions as well. So we are, if you have asked the question, we're getting to it. But Marlene, the question for you is, if a student already has had COVID and has the antibodies, will they have to follow all the same guidelines and uh, follow up? Could a group of kids in that situation work out or practice together? 
You know, that's a really great question that I uh, don't believe we have fully discussed yet. My understanding, but this is really preliminary, um, is that all students are going to go through the same testing process because we don't know um, how long um, folks um, who have had COVID remain um, resistant to it. The science is just not there yet with that. So I think that all students are gonna have to follow uh, the same testing protocol our test is uh, is the um, is is the active antibody test, not the not, you know we're going to look to see whether somebody currently has the virus. We're not doing the kind of testing that would show whether somebody had ever had the virus in the past. Um, but uh, all students, I think, regardless of whether or not they have had COVID in the past, will continue to be engaged in our testing um, protocol. Rod, do you want to say anything about students who have had COVID nineteen in the athletic context? Yeah, sure. Uh, to just uh, reinforce uh, what Dean Sandstrom was saying, um, our, our testing is going to be the antigen type. It'll be the nasal swab uh, self-administered. Um, it'll be supervised um, by a representative of, of the college. Uh, it's not going to be antibody testing to see if you've ever had COVID-19. Uh, and, and like she said, uh, you know, the science isn't really there behind it to say that if you've had it previously, that those antibodies are going to have any effect uh, from you you know, getting further infection or how long that that lasts. Um, so uh, yes, I would anticipate that we would be following the same rules for everybody, regardless of whether or not they had had it previously. Great, thanks. Um, Carolyn, maybe, I don't know if you can speak. There's a number of questions about outing club activities. Um, I don't, I know that's not your direct job, but you might know more than others as the questions also involve Dan usage that you spoke about earlier. Oh, thanks. I was just sending a response to that one question about wolf okay. leaders. Um, so them. some of them are coming through as anonymous, and unfortunately, uh, I'm unable to write you a personal email. So I encourage anyone who has specific questions about PE credit, for example, that is granted to those students who serve as wolf leaders to reach out. Uh, Scott is not on this call, but I will work with him closely. It is my understanding that wolf leaders have done some training, and they are um, serving in some capacity in the new orientation. So I, I think, again, we are willing to work with you on that. But specific questions, please don't, you know, just reach out. I'm happy to answer any of those. Carolyn, while I've got you, uh, there's a question about captain's training and returning early or doing any in-person training. Yeah, so I think Lisa said this at the beginning of the uh, webinar, but to reiterate, we will not have any of the athletes returning early. I think there was a pretty specific timeline sent out, I believe maybe in your email, Marlene, about how and when folks return to campus. Uh, we will typically, captain's training does happen during the fall preseason, so that will not be happening at this point. I will be working with your coaches and our athletic administration to figure out what that will look like this year. Obviously having 75 plus individuals in a space like the Riley room is not going to be the model that we'll use though. So stay in touch or I will be in touch with those of you who are serving as our captains next year and thank you for your service. Let me just jump in to say, if you're wondering where the very detailed information about arrival that I sent you is, I did not do that yet. <laughs> um, it's coming, uh, we have not figured out um, the precise details yet. We're very busily working on that now. You will get a communication um, about arrival date um, and be given a, a, either a date or a window of time. That's the piece that we're working on now. Um, it, there's um, a process by which students when they arrive will initially be tested um, before they enter uh, their, um, their dorm and then will be in, um, uh, in a quarantine until those test results come back um, somewhere between 24 and 48 hours. Uh, and so we're gonna be staging um, the arrival of students. Um, so athletes won't be coming early, um, but all students will be assigned to a particular date uh, or, or, or a range of dates to come back because we have to make sure that we have the capacity to do the testing and the delivering of meals to students' rooms while they're in quarantine for that brief period on the front end. Um, and so everybody won't be coming back at once. We'll be doing those in groups probably of about 200 students at a time. So stay tuned. You will get more precise information 
about the timing of that. And we'll do that as quickly as we can, because I know that many of you are eager to begin to make travel arrangements and plans, and that the more time you have to do that, the better. So we're aware of that, and we're, we're going to try to get that information to you as quickly as we can. Marley, will any of those answers be available before the deadline to respond? I am not sure whether the specifics of the move-in schedule will be ready by July 10th. Um, I, I, I can't guarantee that. Gotcha. Um, also, while I've got you, and I know you referenced this earlier, but there's many questions coming in about the living pods and the practice, potentially practicing pods and athletes uh, choosing to live together. Is that something we would encourage, discourage, allow or not allow specifically? Or, or um, do you speak to that again, Marlene? I will try and I'm going to, uh, I'll um, kind of talk a little bit about the housing piece and then maybe Lisa can talk a little bit about it from the coaches and athletic perspective. Um, students are going to be able to, as always, um, indicate uh, who they would like to live with in a, in a group. And that might be your teammates, um, at, or it might not, you can, but you will identify a group. Um, and then the, uh, there will be a housing lottery in order to match groups of people to physical locations on, on campus. Um, and the housing process can't really um, begin until we know how many students intend to enroll. So uh, I, I know this is a bit of a chicken and egg because some people want to know more about the housing before they decide whether or not to enroll. But obviously some of the details about the housing really depend on how many students intend to enroll. So for example, our preference would be for every student to have a single um, and that's what we'll do if we can. But if the numbers exceed, the number of students who want to return exceeds the number of singles we have, um, then we will turn some of our biggest spaces into doubles. Um, so there's going to be some um, reconfiguration of housing based on the number of expected students to enroll. Um, and uh, then once you have established your pod, as I said, there's going to be some relaxation of, of the social uh, of, the, of the public health guidelines, but I don't want to exaggerate that. I mean, I think what we're imagining there is that in your pod, it's kind of like what your living situation right now, perhaps. So I'm sitting at home right now and I'm not wearing a mask and my husband and my kids are here. We're not wearing masks in the house. Um, and we imagine that if you're in, a, in your common area with your pod, that that's the one group <laughs> that you can Go relax, be, at, be completely at home with not be wearing your mask. But we're not envisioning that that group can then go various places on campus without following the public health guidelines. Um, so what I'm not imagining is that, that that would mean that that group then, for example, could engage in a kind of practice, uh, athletic practice, that is different than what other people on the team can do who are not living together. Um, again, I'm going to have to leave those kinds of micro decisions up to the coaches to figure out what's safe, um, uh, what, and they're going to be using best public, public health guidelines to figure out how to run their practices. Um, but at this point, I'm not anticipating that the coaches are going to make decisions about, um, about what's possible in training as a function of whether students live together or not. Right. I would echo that, Marlene, that the, you know, we'll be making those training groups based on, uh, first and foremost, probably your academic schedule, because we're going to have to set practice time slightly differently without the division of the day. So it might not be that you have a coherent, uh, you know, non-conflicting class schedule with everyone you happen to live with, uh, first of all. And secondly, there'll be sports uh, either by position or by, you know, uh, you know, just different types of grouping that are sport specific, right, that night you won't necessarily pick in with your friends uh, that fit into those other categories, as well as I think the example would be really probably again from a logistical side that suddenly you see, you know, six athletes out there not practicing using any of the protocols and how you're distinguishing that when you're just again walking by just that perception um, of, of, of who's following the rules and not because we really, as I said at the outset, we really depend upon our athletes to model this good behavior uh, for, all, for the entire community. Marlene, there's a follow-up or related question about um, housing, because generally incoming first years aren't, you know, giving preference on who they live with. How will the housing, how will that look like? Um, is there a possibility of that changing for athletes if any of these things we're talking about? So housing for first year students is um, developed by the housing office. So incoming first year students um, will be assigned a, a, a pick group. Um, that's not specific to COVID. That's the way that um, we have always um, 
composed housing. So incoming students come uh, already uh, with a living a group. Uh, and uh, that will be the group that you can have some of those relaxed um, protocols when you're in your own common spaces with. I, th that, that process of uh, mashing first year students into living groups is not based on athletic participation. Great. Um, Lisa, uh, almost all of the indoor um, winter sports are asking the same question that I know you don't know the answer to, but let me reiterate, we're hearing from squash and basketball and swimming and ice hockey and uh, about what's the likelihood of them being able to practice on October 15th. Um, and then relatedly, can somebody go hit squash balls or shoot baskets um, before then? What will that look like? I know. You don't know. Well, when we return in the fall, our indoor spaces will most likely not be open as we sort of, again, work through protocol, set those spaces up, uh, think about how we can, what numbers of people and how we schedule them. So we'll continue to work on that, you know, now that we know that we're coming back. And as I said, we're waiting for our July 6th state guidelines because um, obviously we have to adhere to those and then we'll start to figure out how these might, how it might look and how it might work. Um, but again, it will not be open doors, come on in, you know, there is a potential. So he's like, okay, we could have you know, one person in a squash court for 20 minutes, whatever the timeline, there's something, there's a ratio between, you know, air ventilation, intensity of the workout, number of people, density, all of that. So there's, you know, a math equation that's beyond me, but we're working on figuring that out, um, the size of the venue. Uh, and if we can be in there, then we will be in there. But again, it wouldn't just be, for instance, use squash for an example. It wouldn't just be come on in and use squash courts. It would be, here's the times you can sign up for, and somebody would, you know, let you in and make sure you were in, you know, we might close certain courts off. Um, to allow some social distancing or space if we think one court, one person per court isn't enough. I'm not sure yet about that. Uh, again, it has to do with density in the entire space, not just in that individual court. So we'll be figuring that out. Um, and again, for October 15th, as I said, you know, we're hopeful, but we literally do not know yet uh, whether those spaces will be open in a normal fashion. I mean, I know they won't be in an open and normal fashion. You wouldn't just have a full team indoors practicing um, as they normally do. Um, and also there's evidence around, you know, what's the increased aspiration when you're um, more and more active. So again, trying to find are there ways that we can start doing things outside um, in those first few weeks in particular, helping folks condition and get ready to get back to play. I know it's not a satisfying answer, but we just really don't know in this moment what that's going to look like. Um, it's an eligibility question that I think is fairly straightforward, but let's answer it because I bet people have this. So can a track athlete who enrolls in the spring compete in both indoor and outdoor tracks? So maybe that's not as straightforward since most of the indoor season takes place in February and March. And if the student has leftover eligibility because he lost the outdoor season last year, can he use it as another, at another school such as grad school? So I think the second part is more straightforward, but for the first part, can a winter track athlete can participate in the second half of the season if they were not here in the fall. So that I think they're saying so they're not here in the fall and when they so right. basically so when they come back in the spring could they could they start competing? Join that would just be that to me would be similar to like what it like if you were abroad and you come back so that that won't that won't be a problem at all. That's right. Yeah, it was, it was real you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I probably made that uh, more okay. challenging than it, than it needed um, to be. Um, uh, somebody's asking if the campus goes to a certain time period with zero new COVID-19 cases, will social distancing protocols be dropped or amended? Uh, Certainly, this is going to be an evolving process, and we're going to be paying very close attention to what's happening here, what's happening in Berkshire County more generally, what's happening in the state of Massachusetts, what kind of um, recommendations we're getting from state and local public health officials. So the answer is yes, that we will be watching that. I'm not anticipating that there will be changes within the fall semester, however. My guess is that what we're putting forth now is going to be uh, in place throughout the fall semester. Great. Um, I'm cruising through these questions. I think there's a lot of, of that are follow-ups, but, um, and um, I don't know, Patrick, maybe it's the time to allow for some live questions if people want to raise their hand. Um, 
Um, but I just did just have a follow up. Oh, Marlene, again, this is an off campus housing question. So many fall athletes have signed leases for off campus housing for their senior year, provided those athletes take a semester off in order to preserve their eligibility. Will they be able to live off campus in the fall of their second semester junior year, which was originally their first semester senior year? That's a great question. And my answer to that is let me find out. Um, I need to talk to uh, the Office of Student Life to figure out exactly what the policy is on that. So I did receive an email from one student already asking me that question. This is trying to get more information. Uh, I'm trying to think about what the best way to disseminate that information is. Maybe I will get that information, Lisa, to you and you can um, put it on the athletic FAQs. Would that work? Yes, thank you. Okay. So I will, I will get information about that to folks. Great. Um, mm -mm. Uh, what about deadlines? If you're a winter or spring athlete that takes the, chooses to take the fall off, what's the deadline to enroll for a second semester? Um, what if part of that decision were to be based on having a season? I think so the, Marlene just said December 1st, right? Yeah, December oh, 1st is the deadline. Um, if you've taken a personal leave, um, or really a leave of any kind, we, you need to uh, request uh, readmission, re-enrollment, by December 1st, if you want to be back for the spring semester. Gotcha, sorry, I missed that. A um, couple Chris, more signing. people how to raise their hands? Did we tell them that? Or? Uh, I was asking Patrick if he can uh, make that happen. I don't see any raised hands. But, but people know that they need to raise their hand. That was my question. Um, people, attendees, you should see a raise your hand um, yeah, toggle at the bottom, which icon. I, I, can't, um, I can't see because I'm on a different. You can raise your hand if you have if you'd like to ask a question um, verbally. There you go. We see there's a guest and they just did it, so that's working. <laughs> um, and I'm not seeing it, so um, I might be looking in the wrong spot. But meanwhile, Marlene, can you another dining question? A lot of food questions on here. So snar very important part of for especially maybe not especially, but I know athletes take the. Uh, frequent the snack bar quite a bit. Do you know anything about that? You're muted. Okay. I will have to look into that. I don't have the details at the tip of my um, fingers at the moment. I believe there will be some to go, to go options, but I, I want to, let me confirm that. And I will, I, I do believe if, um, if you want to at this minute, if you go to the general COVID FAQs, I do believe there is a section on dining that explains which, um, which operations are going to be running. Um, they're all to go, um, but it, it, it should mention the snack bar if it's going to be open for to go options. I think that's the best place to look. And I'll try to look um, in the background in just a second while I'm not talking. So stay tuned. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to um, allow for some live questions. So they may be for you. So, um, uh, so Janice Paul is uh, first on our list. Janice, you'll be allowed to talk. You can unmute yourself. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I thought I had read in the general fact, I have an incoming freshman, um, that the outing club would be uh, operational. Uh, and I'm a bit confused based on some of your discussion today. Um, is that the case? And, it, and if so, what kind of activities would be and opportunities would be available through the outing club? Thank you. Right, so it will be operational, but it will be things that are closer to campus. So uh, I think, and Carolyn can jump in if I get this wrong, but not van travel out to whitewater canoeing, not van traveling out to further places, but you know, hiking from campus, um, what kinds of things can we do nearby? Uh, and I don't know if there are other, other examples of things they can do, but we'll be, it will be active. We'll be trying to actually do some more of that to get outside here. Um, especially in the beautiful fall and take advantage. And Scott Lewis, our director of the outing club is working hard at that, but there will be certain options that we normally do. Like I said, you might you know, normally travel out to go whitewater canoeing, um, whitewater rafting. We won't be able to do that, um, anything that's off campus or they can't start from campus. Luckily, this is endlessly creative and has been very busily thinking about what things can be done. Snowshoeing, for example, can be done right on campus and he's very busy thinking about how to um, highlight all of the things that are close to home and don't require travel. I did check and there will be snack bar to go. <laughs> okay, great. Um, we have another raised hand, Christine. Um, 
just one name needed. Christine, you're, you're unmuted. Yeah, or unmute yourself. Hi, there you are. Um, so my question is, if you, if a student takes a personal leave for spring semester, is that with, in essence, no questions asked and no questions asked for re-enrollment? Because the having permission or seeking permission to re-enroll, I guess, is what's confusing me. I just want to confirm that they, because of the situation with COVID, they can take the fall off, they can take the spring off with absolutely no questions asked and be re-enrolled. That's right, Christy. So it's the, the, the your, there's the, the petition to re-enroll is really not about permission, but about us making sure for personal leaves that we know that somebody's coming back so that we get them set up for pre-registration for courses, for housing, et cetera. Um, but students may take a personal leave for either semester. Um, and our intention is for students to be able to um, decide anywhere between one semester and six semesters how long they'd like that leave to be. And we're going to work really hard to make sure the students can come back when they want to come back from that leave. Okay. Thank you. Great. Rod, uh, there's a question about rehabbing injuries. Um, if the training room isn't open um, for, uh, for you know, adequate rehab for a particular person for a variety of reasons, would students be permitted to leave campus for PT elsewhere? Maybe that's for you and or for Marlene. Well, I'll start with that. Um, I, you know, I do anticipate having uh, the athletic training room, to us being able to host uh, rehabilitation. I think some things may be on a case-to-case -case basis. I had mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, some of the rehabilitation exercises might be guided by athletic trainers, but things that you could do at home, you know, uh, you know examples of that, like a, a simple ankle sprain where you could potentially give someone some rubber tubing and some exercises that they could do in their, their dorm. We would look to move those types of things outside. But, you know, uh, again, coming back to the idea of case-by-case, case, you know, if it was uh, – an injury, uh, you know, a post-surgical thing that required um, more closely guided treatment, uh, we would try to uh, arrange to have that done in the athletic training room. Uh, in regards to traveling off campus uh, for physical therapy, I might have to, uh, to point that one over to Marlene. Um, you know, I, I know that there are services available within the local area uh, close to campus, but in regards to traveling off campus for those services, um, it's unclear to me. That's uh, um, something that is in process right now, trying to figure out what our non-emergency transport for things like doctor's appointments within Berkshire County will look like. We hope to be able to offer that, but we're in the process of figuring out how we can do that safely. Great. Um, Marlene, can you speak about the housing, a housing lottery for students who were not in the housing lottery initially and then pulled in by an RD who spoke uh, I'm not sure I understand that question. Uh, well, I didn't either. I was hoping you were going to understand what an RD is. I don't know what an RD is. I think is. it's a resident director. So I think the question has, oops. Um, I think um, there's a process where if you're a housing coordinator or a resident oh. director, you can um, pull folks in and be part of the housing pick. And several students have reached out to ask whether they, the assignments that they already had as a result of that, whether those are, whether they're going to be able to keep, stick with those or whether they're going to be lumped in with everyone else. And the answer to that is that the director, um, the, the, the senior associate dean of campus life is going to be in touch about the details of housing. This is something that I imagine people really want to know sooner rather than later. So I'm putting it right now on my list along with the other couple questions that, I, that I've jotted down. So I will try to um, get those answers and get them posted to the athletic FAQ as soon as I can so that you can know how the housing will work as you're making your decision about intent to enroll. Great. Um, Marlene, this is a question directed directly at you personally, I think. In a good, how would you counsel a winter athlete to decide whether or not to return, given all the unanswered questions and uncertainties? I know, pretty impossible, but somebody wants to know what you think specifically. Wow. Um, you know, that's, it's such a personal uh, decision and also has to do with individual, I mean, I, there's so many things that go into this. You can tell already, I'm not going to give a straight answer to this question. This right. is like, of that. <laughs> are, are you, are you going to run for president? And they, they, the person answers everything but that question. Um, <laughs> the things that you need to, there are several things that you need to be thinking about. And one is, um, what's your tolerance for uncertainty? Um, because 
I, I just, things are uncertain right now. And uh, I, I wish that I could change that because we would all feel much better and function better if we had some, some nailed down answers to some questions, especially about the things that are important um, to us. And I know that for the folks who are on this call, athletics is incredibly important um, to, to, to all of you. Um, at this point, we really don't know um, whether or not there are going to be winter sports. I, if, I, if I led in one direction or another, I would be guessing it would be of no use um, to anybody. If you absolutely know that you don't have tolerance for uncertainty and that you really want to make sure that you have four full years of winter sports, taking a full year leave is a way to absolutely um, guarantee that. If you take a full year leave, um, and then you would know that when you came back, you would have four years of eligibility, assuming that we can then look in the, the rear view mirror and COVID is completely behind us by then. Um, uh, short of that, uh, it involves, you know, taking, um, making calculated guesses. And that's something that um, I encourage students to think about, to talk to their families about it, to talk to their individual coaches about it. Um, and there's no perfect decision. Um, I'm sorry that that's an unsatisfying answer. Let me add, can I just add something that we didn't talk about? One of the other options um, short of the full season, because we've been sort of focused on how do you get your full season back? If you came this uh, fall and then it turned out you had a decision that we, or we made a decision we weren't going to have winter competition. Even in that scenario, one would be allowed to enroll in second semester of their terminal of their final year, right? When they had the one semester left. And they could begin competing and practicing as soon as we finish finals in December. So you would get substantial part of that season. You would miss November 1st through the end of finals um, in first semester, but starting in December through the end of that um, season in the second semester, you would be able to have that much of the season if that helped you um, think about this a little bit more in, in, in a calculated um, decision that you're making about this fall. It's not an all or nothing. Um, so if that helps you think about other options um, if you came and the other part of it didn't work out as we're trying to, to get to that part. And also we really are hopeful that we will have that answer um, before July 10th to give you that clarity to just let you know a little bit. Again, the uncertainty would still exist about what would happen, um, but some clarity about what the options are. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that it's not a binary all or nothing because um, many of you, um, for many of you, taking a full year off is just not what you want to do. Um, and that's a big price to pay to guarantee four full seasons. And I think it's really important to keep in mind, A, that there, we may have some more information that will make you feel more confident that if you take the spring off that you will capture the whole season on the tail end. Um, and even if that's not possible, there's a chunk of the season that you would likely be able to participate in. So Lisa, thank you for adding that. I want to remind the attendees if you have if your question hasn't been answered for some reason or you have a question you can raise your hand to ask um, a live question. Um, there's a question another housing question uh, off campus housing question uh, if a senior who is planning to live off campus decides to take a leave can another senior who is intending to live on campus take over their lease and enroll as an in person student. Unfortunately not, um, because we're only allowing students who went through the petition process and were approved to be enrolled in person as an in-person student and live off campus. Great, and regarding the on-campus pods, do you know if they'll be same gender or mixed gender? I believe they can be mixed. Great, thank you. Um, looking for some hand raised. Um, another eligibility-ish question. If a student starts the year on campus and by October or November things have taken a turn for the worse and the school decides to return to online learning only, would the student be allowed to apply to defer the remainder of the year and have the first couple of months not count as a semester toward eligibility? I think some people did that this spring. Right, if that's Are how you I'm talking about it. their athletic eligibility? Uh, yes, yeah, so I guess so with regards to that again is so long as they don't compete their athletic eligibility will be kept intact with regards to how they matriculate through Williams and all that stuff. I'll I'll defer to Marlene on that smartly. <laughs> 
So um, if you, there's some information on the Dean's Office website about timing of taking leaves from the college and at what point you can do that um, and sort of decide that you want to take a leave and have the semester wiped off the transcript not count. Um, and then there's a point after which you would receive W's on your um, transcript as a withdrawal. Um, and those courses would count as deficiencies that you would need to make up elsewhere before you could return to Williams. So it would be important to, to check, to look on the, um, on the Dean's Office website on the section about withdrawals to get more detailed information about how that works. Great. Um, Rod, you want to clarify access to um, athletic trainers? And so um, if somebody does not enroll for the fall, will they have access to uh, trainers in any way? I'm not sure that I can answer that question. Um, I think that uh, in regards to, you know, what students have access to athletic training services, I know that our students that are on, on campus and that are enrolled uh, will have access to those services that I, I mentioned, although they'll be limited, uh, they'll be appointment only, uh, there can only be a certain number of people uh, per room. But in regards to, you know, if it was uh, an athlete who was not enrolled in the college and living, uh, you know, off campus, I, I don't think that that's an option, but yeah, uh, it won't be an option. So only so students who are enrolled remotely, regardless of where they live, whether it's in Williamstown or in Savannah or uh, Texas or internationally, you won't have access to campus resources um, or facilities. You have to be enrolled in person in order to have access to those, those resources. I also wanted to mention uh, just, and I should have said this earlier too, that you know, if you're a student athlete out there or a parent and you have specific questions about the sports medicine services and what they'll look like in the fall, please feel free to email me. Um, you can find me uh, through the college website. Great, thanks. I wanna remind everybody we're coming up on 3.30. So if you do have any questions, so go ahead and raise your hand. We still have a few here, of course. Um, and uh, Lisa, back to league uh, NESCAC question. Will there, we do anticipate a league-wide decision on winter sports at all, or will it continue to be school by school? And could there be a NESCAC season without everybody? Yeah, so we're continuing to figure that out. We're trying to put um, preliminary NESCAC schedules together for our NESCAC-sponsored sports. So um, in the winter, as in particular, um, basketball, and ice hockey that have this, uh, I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting anybody, I'm trying to oh, squash as I'm going through my head about who plays a NESCAC schedule developed by the conference office. Um, those schedules will be developed to begin in January, um, thinking that if we get something in this fall before we go home, uh, if things really turn around again, it's fairly unlikely that that will happen. Um, but that is that is not a question that's been decided yet. So we're working on those conference schedules to begin um, at some point in January, we're trying to figure out amongst ourselves what makes the most sense in terms of the start of those. Uh, and also trying to figure out how many, how many um, institutions we need to be in in order to make it a conference schedule. Uh, so that's work we're still doing. Uh, we'll meet in the next day or two to sort of just take a look at those and what might they look like. Um, and we're trying to be as flexible as possible so that again, if things suddenly became available to us that we'd be ready to go um, and, and activate those schedules if that could happen. Uh, again, we don't anticipate the ability to do that. Well, for one thing, um, some institutions have said, uh, we said no fall sports competition, not, um, not no competition in the fall semester, although some schools have said that. Um, institutions have said no fall participation at all. Uh, therefore, we know that we are not putting a conference schedule together until we can possibly return. And I think we're all still trying to figure out when our institutions can make those decisions. And we know that they'll be a little bit later, uh, again, probably October or November. And, and I don't know if we'll come together. I know that there was a lot of hope at one point that all of us would come together um, and have a conference-wide decision. But if you read the founding documents of NESCAC, it was based on institutional autonomy. And we're staying true to that. Uh, lots of different, we're in five different states with different guidelines, which made it really difficult. Um, different kinds of student bodies, different places. There are just so many differences amongst our institutions. Uh, so everyone was sort of ended up, we just need to make the decision that's right for our own campus. Uh, and again, so again, we'll be figuring that out, uh, what that will look like as we go forward. And I, 
don't know um, if it'll be a conference-wide decision or institution by institution. Great. Um, sorry. Um, I know we just have a couple more here, but I missed something. There are a couple questions, Marlene, specific. If a student studies remotely in the fall, are they doing their housing sign up for the spring now or some future? If you are studying remotely for the fall, uh, but you're interested in being in person for the spring, um, we'll be getting in touch with everybody to double check about that midway through the fall semester and we'll make sure that folks who are interested get included in all the housing processes for the spring. So that's one piece that you don't have to worry about right now. Great. Um, a lot of these questions I think have been answered and we are at uh, 327. Lots and lots of housing questions, Marlene, so I know you can expect um, to hear from people. Um, one quick question about uh, walking with your original class. If you uh, take an extra fall, can you still walk with your original class if you took a one semester personal leave? Uh, when, when students take a leave and then they're off cycle, uh, they can participate in all of the celebrations of the, their original cohort, but they cannot walk at graduation until they've completed their graduation requirements. Um, so uh, you'd be able to, you have a choice um, if you're off cycle in terms of senior week and some of the other fun things you can pick, whether you want to do that with your original cohort or the next year's cohort. But uh, unfortunately, you have to have completed all your degree requirements to actually be able to, to walk across the stage and get your degree. Great. Uh, Lisa, one more quick question. I don't know if we know the answer to this, and currently I know the answer is no, but are there, will there be any possibility for people to like check out equipment such as, you know, weights or medicine balls or that kind of stuff that can't be used um, indoors now to use in their pods? Does anybody? Have, we won't, uh, right, we won't check equipment out. Again, we might set up um, some satellite um, sites if we can that maybe certain teams will use. We still need to have a disinfection plan. We'd, one, we don't have the capacity to have, you know, a medicine ball for every student on campus, for instance, right? So that's not going to happen. Um, and so then the shared equipment needs to be cleaned in a very particular way, and we'll be working through those plans. But again, if we could have multiple sites um, that we could do that, and again, assign to specific groups of students, it would again uh, limit that sort of contact with those surfaces. Um, and I'm going to just do a wrap up if you're, if you, you know, we're at 329. Yeah, yep. One, I just want to thank the panelists uh, for their time. I know it's a, uh, a busy time and you guys are on a lot of these town halls and have a lot of questions coming your way. So thank you so much for taking the time to meet with our student athletes, their families and other students interested in club and um, outing club and PE offerings. It's a, it's a lot to, to sort through. And again, the point of this was to uh, help you make decisions, have some clarity about what's happening. And I again want to acknowledge that I know this is an incredibly uncertain time and it's a really difficult time. I, I'm very hopeful that you are safe and healthy um, as much as you can be. I know it's almost impossible that some of you haven't been affected by um, the virus and I wish you all well. And we so wish that, uh, well, one, we can't wait for you to get back to campus and we so wish that we could play games again um, and we're working hard to get there and, and we're hoping that this fall we can work hard to keep everybody safe and get back to that. So thank you. Um, take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>